Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I want to just make three points this evening, if I may. First, uh, that practical and affordable carbon reduction measures exist today. The challenge is to deploy them at scale. Second, collaboration will be essential. And third, although progress is being made, there's a need for stronger political leadership in so many parts of the world. To avoid the worst consequences of climate change, we're told we've got to reduce carbon emissions by between 8 and 12 gigatons a year by 2058, 50 years' time, compared with business-as-usual projections. And that's an amount greater than the total global emissions today, an enormous challenge when set against the 50% increase in population and significant improvements in living standards expected during the same period. To get there, it's clear we've got to do three things. First, take energy out of GDP through a revolution in energy efficiency. Second, take carbon out of energy through fundamentally changing the mix of energy we use. And thirdly, to halt destruction of carbon-rich assets, notably the world's forests. One of the more compelling studies that I've read on climate change, and I expect many of you have, is the Princeton Wedges study authored by Professor Bob Sokolow. That work identifies 15 strategies, each of which would lower carbon emissions by a gigaton. If pursued simultaneously, these strategies or wedges would therefore allow us to meet the required reductions over time. And let me give you an example. Achieving a wedge in solar power would require increasing solar capacity by 700 times compared with that of today. Now that sounds like a very, very large challenge, and indeed it is. But viewed through the lens of compound annual growth rates, consistently applied, it looks rather less daunting. 700 times over 50 years translates to a compound growth rate of 14% a year. And by comparison, the IEA predicts an annual growth rate in solar electricity of 17% a year out to 2030. And actual growth rates in solar power have been even higher. The sector grew by 47% in 2007. Total investment in low carbon energy and energy efficiency stood at around $150 billion last year. So the market is already stepping up. The challenge will be to continue deploying low-carbon solutions quickly and at scale in the years ahead. And doing so is going to require an ironclad partnership between four groups, government, business, engineers, and NGOs. And today I'm going to speak on behalf of two of those, and it won't be NGOs or government. It will be as business as a businessman and as an engineer. Uh, I do recognize that the starting point for the partnership is getting policy design right. And I believe a good deal of progress has already been made here with a clear consensus in place over the portfolio of policies that are needed. The most fundamental component is pricing in the carbon externality. A combination of measures is going to be needed to do that cap-and-trade schemes to drive emission reductions from large stationary emitters, a mix of taxes and regulations to promote energy efficiency at the consumer level, and a new financial framework to encourage the preservation of forests. There's also the need for transitional technology incentives in addition to carbon pricing, and the purpose of these is to accelerate the development and deployment of low-carbon technologies reducing their costs to the point where they can compete on a level playing field with a carbon price. And R&D is best stimulated by capital-based incentives, whereas deployment requires production incentives that are clear, stable, and long-term. Barriers to low-carbon energy must also be removed globally. For renewables, it's clear that planning laws and grid connection regulations remain big obstacles. A more fundamental barrier is enduring conventional energy subsidies, 
which total around $200 billion a year globally, compared with just $33 billion for nuclear and renewables. Finally, government-driven energy infrastructure products are going to be critical. An example is carbon dioxide pipelines, necessary if carbon capture and storage is ever to be deployed at scale. So, the Princeton work shows that there are practical climate change mitigation choices available now, and there's a clear consensus about the policies needed to deploy these solutions. So what then is missing? Taking a global view, I believe the answer is sustained, outward-looking political leadership, leadership that's strong enough to overcome the significant political challenges. One such challenge is managing the trade-offs between climate change mitigation and the other two objectives of energy policy, promoting energy security and maintaining low-cost supplies. In the EUK, for example, substituting coal with gas-fired electricity generation has helped lower emissions, but it's also increased our dependence on foreign gas. At the EU level, the proposal to introduce a more robust carbon price after 2012 is causing concern amongst energy-intensive industries that they're going to lose out to international competition. And that leads to a second political challenge, navigating interest group politics. Because putting in place the basket of policies that I've described are going to, is going to entail winners and losers. For example, the billions of euros likely to be raised through auctioning carbon permits is leading to fears of political sclerosis, with various lobbies vying to gain access to these funds. Overcoming vested interests and preventing lobby capture is especially difficult in strongly represented democracies, where institutions, of course, are deliberately designed to create checks and balances. Similar dynamics are also playing out, but between countries in the current round of international climate negotiations these dynamics are even more difficult to manage because international institutions are weaker than nation states and because of the emotive equity issues at stake. Another leadership challenge is sustaining climate policies over time when the results of that leadership may not be visible for years or even decades. The Stern Report argues convincingly that the risk-adjusted cost of doing nothing greatly exceed the costs of taking action over a longer time frame. However, politics are inherently short-term, especially in countries with rapid election cycles. There's a danger that political oxygen is drawn from long-term climate policies to more visible, but ultimately less important, short-term economic problems. On top of all this, policy principles will need to be translated into practical, workable, and acceptable rules. And that's hard, very unglamorous work, which will require great political stamina. So I believe sustained, long-term, and international political leadership remains today's rate-determining step. But we've seen that kind of leadership before, after World War II, for example. And I remain, again, optimistic that we're going to see it again. Thank you very much.